Hey guys, Joe Pye here at Advanced Innovations. Welcome back to the shop. This particular video is going to be about cutter edge management. And I think that's a, probably a pretty accurate statement. This is about end mills and how to get the most out of your end mill and maybe give you something to think about about how you're using your end mill. Now a question that I get a lot is, let's say you're cutting a half inch deep chunk of God knows what out of a part. Half inch deep and half inch wide. Is it better to go 60 thou deep or 100 thou deep and make a bunch of horizontal passes on it until you get down to 500? Or is it better to sit the end mill on the side, take a full bite, and take 60, 80, 100 thou off at a pop and conventional and climb mill, whatever you have to do? What's better? Is there a difference? Well, actually, when you get down to the nuts and bolts and the numbers of it all, they are identical. Material removal rate, cubic inches of material being removed per minute, uh, the amount of material coming off that part versus the time it took to do it, identical. But, here's the but. If you're a big shop and you have a million end mills and you can go one rough, one finish, then it really makes no difference. Here's, here's the thought. Here's your block. You've got your end mill coming down like so. You take a bite, you take a bite, you take a bite, boom, finished. What have you just effectively done with this end mill? You've used this part of the end mill right there all the way down because the wear zone on the end mill now translates from the cuts that you've taken. Better than average chance that when you get to the bottom of the cut or on the last part or however many parts you have to do, the wall of whatever feature you just did, this is drastic now, so don't hold that against me, is now going to do that. You have worn out the bottom region of that end mill by nibbling away at it on the Z. Makes sense, right? If you were to sit the end mill on the side of the part and do the exact same thing but in a vertical format, You have used that zone on that cutter, and the wear will be even, probably, and by the time you get over to here, you still have a nice square corner left on the bottom of that cutter. So that is what I would think the advantage to taking a full bite and walking it in using nicks and white and not coming down on the Z. Especially obvious when you're cutting a channel or something or a slot, a bottom slot or something and you got a nice pin on the top or a gauge block and say, oh this goes really good and you try to stick it down in there and it just kind of hesitates about a sixteenth of an inch from the bottom of the slot and you go, well, I don't know, what happened to the cutter? How come the block doesn't go all the way to the bottom? And you dial in a little bit more and a little bit more and before you know it the top is blown up and now the pin goes to the bottom but the top is too big. That's why. All right. Standard end mill. How many different shapes can you cut with a standard end mill? Yeah, all you guys are scrambling for the two on the keyboard. That average, that's about right, right? Two? How about four? You have your end mill. I'm gonna, we're just going to look at the bottom of the end mill there for a second. Cylindrical. Here's your teeth, whatever. If you plunge with the end mill, there's one. Circle. If you traverse with the end mill, it's a channel. Channel or a notch. If your machine has the capability to tilt ever so slightly, you can create a cove feature by using just the bottom corner of the end mill. You can create a dish shape in the surface of your part by either pushing or dragging the end mill across the part with the head tilted or the cutter tilted. It doesn't work the same with the part tilted and that will be number four. So for three we put down a moon and for number four Now 
notches. Serrations like you would find on the top of a pistol on either side for traction. Those little notches. If the cutter hits the part at an angle, you end up with notches. And you can see how that would work well for putting serrations in the slide of a handgun or whatever other feature. You can also create other than 90 degree features by doing it twice. Cut one side first, cut the other side second. But whatever those serrations are, they have to be at least 90 degrees because the bottom of the cutter is 90 degrees when it's moving. So, all right. Let's get back to that cutter management thing. Let's go to the stair steps here. Cutter management. You're going to say, okay, well, I need to cut a slot in a part, and I can't take a full bite because it's a slot. I just can't do it. Well, the way I would approach that, and hopefully this marker holds up, you have your part. Let's draw a 3D. That's kind of a crappy marker. Got to be a better one hiding here somewhere. There you go. Now we're talking. There's your part. you got to cut a slot right in the top of this, channel through it, whatever. The way I would approach a job like this, and I know a lot of you guys are saying, man, I know how I'm going to do it. Bunch of holes, right? Pop a bunch of holes in there. Because the two fastest ways to remove material in a machine shop, saw it, drill it. I'm not talking water jet lasers, giant shears, whatever. Saw it and drill it. Two fastest ways to remove material in any shop. Drill a series of holes in here, and then when you put your end mill in, don't drag the end mill back and forth across the holes because it's going to go as you take the ribs out. Nibble away at it. Use the cylindrical feature to do your roughing. Line up your end mill, plunge down. Lift, shift the table, plunge it, shift the table, plunge it. Nibble away at it. You are not doing any damage to the side you want to now end up with. That zone that you want to have cut good for you, when you get to the point where you need to form the walls or achieve the dimension, that particular edge is still intact. So you use one feature or roughing it all out, pecking away at it, and then you keep it at depth and you walk it back and forth with a nice clean side. Now, depending on how aggressive you get, you could chip the edges off the end mill, but don't. <laughs> I'm not saying use half the diameter of the end mill, and I'm not saying use 15 thou either. Take a good bite. Leave a little bit of drag on the quill lock, and as you come down, you'll feel it. You'll feel it trying to reject. Do not use a two-flute end mill to do this, because as one flute comes off, the other may or may not have already started, and the opportunity for the end mill to dive into the part and take too much of a bite on the second side or give you an extreme bounce on your handle is greatly amplified, so don't do it. Let's take a walk out of the shop. I will do exactly that, what I just said. I'll pop a bunch of holes in a part, I'll nibble away at it, and I'll finish the channel, and it's only going to take a couple minutes, and I'll do it in a piece of 303 stainless laying out there. I'll do it in stainless steel just so nobody complains that I used plastic or wood. All right, let's take a walk. All right, I'll tell you what I'm going to do here. I'm going to drill a couple of holes side by side by side for the first half of this slot. Then I'm going to skip one and I'm going to go to the end and I'm going to drill the hole that defines the end of the slot. Just to give you some idea how quick this can be with and without holes. This is a 343 diameter drill. This is a one inch square piece of 303 stainless. And I'm going to finish it off with a four flute three quarter end mill. We're going three quarters of an inch deep. This is a bottom slot. So I'm just going to push this drill right through this material. I am not going to use a center drill, pilot drill, spot drill, or voodoo magic to make this happen. Just sheer pressure and a little bit of uh, the coolant is WD-40. Let's see if this works.
knowing that I'm going to use a 375 cutter to finish this, these holes are spaced at 375 center to center each. And you can see I skipped the wall on the end just to give us something to judge the progress by. Let me change over to a end mill and we will chew this out of there. Make sure that the bottom of these slots is clean. Uh, too much pressure on the bottom and you can start blowing edges off your cutter. So let's uh, start clean and end well. Drilling operation was done at 750 RPM. I'm going to do the same with the cutter, the end mill. Let's raise the table up and set our depth. Uh, now, in order for the backlash not to pull the part this way, because the cutter is rotating this way, the leading edge is going to be doing the impact, and it's going to have a tendency to want to walk in. I'm going to give a gentle counterclockwise rotation to my Y-axis dial to back the backlash out. It just makes it a whole lot more rigid. I think it's really important to say it is five minutes after three right now, so let's see how fast this goes. Make sure that your locks on your table and your quill are snugged up when you start breaking through these webs. It will be an interrupted cut. It's going to make some noise and it's going to want to pull. So a little bit of drag on all the locks is highly recommended. Alright, for anybody that's wondering, this is a 750 deep slot and this initial pass, because of the drill point versus the flat bottom geometry of the cutter, did not go all the way to the bottom. When I make my first pass on the X with the cutter, I will maintain light downward pressure on the cutter and allow the cutter to create a slope on the bottom of this slot. I will then return to the starting point to take the wedge out. So it's going to be like a Z cut, down and back. Okay, please bear in mind that when I show you the clock that I just had to go across the shop into my office, retrieve new batteries, put the batteries in the camera for this particular time shot. It was five minutes after three when I started that slot. It is done. Changing the batteries in the camera, it is only ten minutes later. I would say that's a win for 303 stainless. Naturally harder materials, 304, 316, get into the L's, ink canals, Hasteloids, Waspaloids, and uh, all that other fun stuff. Be a different story. Let's pop this out, blow it off, take a look. Alright, we are looking at this part exactly as it was sitting in the machine. I do believe the camera angle picked up on this dot and this painted end. This was clean. And you can see the finish on the inside. Now for anybody that didn't understand that zigzag ramp thing going on that I was talking about, 
as the cutter comes down, let's just say the bottom of the block is the, is the surface that you want to finish to. It's not a through hole, but just for illustration. What you need to do is as you traverse the slot, you go deeper as you get towards the end. When you get to the end, you come back and you take that ramp out. All right. So even if you're on top and you're moving back and forth with the table, you can do the same thing. You can zigzag down into the part if the cutter and the material and the conditions will allow. So that's what happened there. First half of this slot is solid material. So we can expect if there's any rebound from the cutter spinning, it's going to come to this side. It's going to want to kick the cutter this way because the leading edge of the cutter off it's coming like a roll. And there you go. Those little nibble marks right there in the wall, you can see them right here. And then from the center out, they're almost non-existent. And that is because of the additional load on the tool. The tool flexing, table possibly creeping, but I had my Y-axis backed out. So I'm going to blame this on the diameter of the cutter and the load on the tool. See them in there? Yep. If you know that's going to happen and you're going to walk your end mill back and forth anyway, bias the cut to the back so when it flexes, it flexes into good material. I do have another video on that called Cutter Flex by all means. Go check it out. And there you go. Even with changing the camera batteries, drilling four holes, changing the tool, and completing this slot, 11 minutes tops, start to finish. 303 stainless, 3 8 750 deep. That nibble is a great way to do it. And it saves the edge of the cutter. I mean, look how clean that is all the way to the bottom. That's just beautiful. All right, guys, if you haven't tried it, tried it. Make sure that your locks are secure or at least dragging heavily on all directions. Take the backlash out because this can be a violent operation. Give it a go. Save some time. Save some cutters. Better yet. All right, guys. Well, I think that demonstration spoke for itself. You can see how much quicker you can get after a part. And doing that, you're abusing the part of the cutter that you really don't need for the final operation. So think about the cutter itself. Think about these four options. Which way you're going to do the feature that you're looking at. And what feature you can beat on and what feature you're going to need to create your finished surface. That's all I got. I think it's, uh, it's a good one to keep in your box. Thank you very much for watching. Joe Pye, Advanced Innovations in Austin, Texas. I'm out.